Alright, so I might be a bit late to talk about Barbie and Oppenheimer, but I would like to talk about them anyway. I want to get my opinion on them out there, especially because Barbenheimer is such a special phenomenon in film history. Something like this just doesn't happen every week. I guess I'll talk about the movie which I saw first, Barbie. And what a movie to start off with. I was honestly quite skeptical in the lead up to the release because I didn't think the trailers were that good and didn't actually know what the premise was. But luckily Greta Gerwig doesn't miss. I never doubted her, even if the trailers had me worried. She's a phenomenal director and a great writer. This film could have been a disaster if the wrong writer slash director stepped in. The first thing you notice when watching is how the film looks. Incredible production design that pops with colour. The whole of Barbie world looks great. It definitely wasn't half assed lots of attention was given to how this looks. That includes the costume design which is already iconic. I mean, this film had people going to the cinema dressed in all pink. It had me dressed in all pink. And I can guarantee people will be dressing up as Barbie and Ken for Halloween. Maybe even Alan too. Ken's cowboy outfit, the roller skating costumes, and the many, many pink outfits worn by Barbie are really good. And like I said, already iconic. This is probably the pinkest film I've ever seen in the best way possible. It's eye candy with the substance to back it up. Hair and makeup is great as expected. They look like Barbies, which is kind of fundamental in a movie about Barbie. So the actors look great in their roles, but are they any good? I'm happy to report that they are. Everyone is pretty much perfectly cast. From Margot Robbie as Barbie herself, Michael Serra as Alan, Emma Mackey, Kate McKinnon, who I don't usually love, was great here. Issa Rae and especially Ryan Gosling, who delivers probably the best performance in the film. He's hilarious and brings the Kennedy tenfold. I genuinely hope he gets nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Oscars. Not everyone can give a performance so nuanced, funny and without missing a beat. Speaking of beats, the soundtrack works really well. And so does that segue if I do say so myself. Like soundtracks should be, this was tailored perfectly to the film. I've had Dance the Night stuck in my head for weeks, but What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish was probably the standout for me though. She also doesn't miss. If you need a song for a soundtrack, the first two people I'd ask are Billie Eilish and Dominic Fike, who also appears on the soundtrack with Hey Blondie. Now, I'd like to talk about the most controversial part of the film for me, the script. For the most part, I think it's a well-written film. The jokes in this are great with few misses, making it one of the best comedies of the year, if not the best. This movie clearly has a lot to say. It's not just a vapid eye candy comedy. It is a critique of the patriarchy and does so by dissecting men and women, their roles within the patriarchy and how it ultimately hurts everyone involved, including men. This is not an anti-men film and shouldn't be viewed that way as that's not what it's trying to say. A lot of this film is about inclusivity and self-acceptance. It does make fun of men, but makes fun of everyone else too. These are only jokes and shouldn't offend anyone, especially when they are this funny. My problems with the script, however, lie within the pacing and the third act. The pacing takes a small dip in the middle of the film, slowing down when they get into the real world. Not a massive issue for me, especially compared to the writing towards the end. This is because the film ends with characters just vocalising the message and the meaning of the film. There isn't much subtlety with how the third act plays out. Everything is resolved by telling instead of showing. America Ferreira's character gets this realisation about Barbie world, and from there we get a lot of characters telling other characters what's wrong with Barbie world and how to fix it, in turn, telling the audience. Basically, it gives exposition for the meaning of the film, and if you catch on to that while watching, it does take you out of the movie for a second. It's fundamental for a good film to show and not tell, and unfortunately, the ending of this forgets to do so. But overall, Barbie is an amazing film. A showcase in fantastic production design, hair and makeup, performances, and with a story that will mean so much to so many people. It may not stick the landing completely, 
but that doesn't detract from the great work done by Greta Gerwig and everyone else involved. For my score, I've gone back and forth between 3.5 out of 5 and 4 out of 5, simply because the writing does fall slightly apart in the ending, but for now I've landed on 4 out of 5. This could change on a rewatch depending on if my issues with the film bug me enough, but Barbie has done so much good, not only within its filmmaking, but for the film industry as a whole. This is a revolutionary and game-changing film, just like the next movie I'm going to talk about, Oppenheimer. One of the reasons why these films are so incredible is because they are driven by auteur directors. Barbie has Greta Gerwig, while Oppenheimer has Christopher Nolan. A fantastic director, put plain and simply. He may not be the most interesting or nuanced director, usually letting the score carry the film, but he's definitely one of the great modern directors, and Oppenheimer might be one of his best. In the wrong hands, this could have been a mess. It's a biopic, without falling into the same tropes and structure that most biopics do. I don't usually enjoy biopics for that reason. They're formulaic with a formula that doesn't work. Luckily, Oppenheimer doesn't feel this way. A reason for this is the script. It's a film that plays with non-linear storytelling. We bounce around the timeline often, giving us the full picture piece by piece, slowly drip feeding us the story. This works as it keeps us engaged while also keeping valuable information until the third act of the film. By doing this, it avoids the trappings of feeling like a Wikipedia article and more like a piece of cinema. Most of the scenes of this film are simply conversations in classrooms, boardrooms and laboratories but they manage to be entertaining even when nothing seems to be happening. This is mostly down to the script, score, and performances. Oppenheimer's score by Ludwig Göransson is one of the best from Nolan's filmography, up there with Interstellar for me. It combines the feelings of nihilism with a sense of undoing, matching perfectly with the themes and ideas of the movie. I think this score will be just as iconic as the one from Interstellar, one of my personal favourite films from Christopher Nolan. The performances in this one were great across the board, with the standouts being Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. It's great to finally see Robert Downey Jr. again on the big screen. He gave my second favourite performance of the film, second only to Killian Murphy. This is a massive role and extremely intense too. Not just anyone could pull this off. Killian gave maybe his best performance while also looking weirdly alike to the real Robert J. Oppenheimer. This, however, is not a one-man show, and just like Barbie, it is an ensemble of many, many great actors who don't turn in a bad performance, even if some feel underutilized as they don't get a lot to do. Technically, this movie is a masterpiece. The cinematography was stunning, the editing was immaculate, and the sound design was crisp. This film is loud though, which is obviously not a bad thing. Well, it is if that means you can't hear the characters. This is also a problem that people had with Tenet when that came out. Bad audio mixing. This is a common criticism for Nolan's work, and it does affect Oppenheimer. The audio mix is far from perfect, but didn't bother me too much. Not as much as the pacing did. Roughly two thirds into the film, it felt like it was going to end, but instead it was ramping up for a whole other stretch of the story. I do feel like this part of the story was necessary and gives it more layers, but sacrifices how the film is paced in the meantime. It's a long film, but it is fast. Just because I thought the pacing wasn't great doesn't mean it isn't a fast film. The editing and how fast the story plays out makes for a film that moves at breakneck speed. They've got a lot of ground to cover, so its speed was necessary. When I originally wrote that this movie is loud, I meant to go on to say that when the bomb went off, I was so scared I was sinking in my seat, clenching my ears, awaiting the loud noise. But obviously there's an initial silence, so I think to myself that I'm in the clear as I guessed enough time had passed. So I relax a little. As soon as I relax, I hear this booming explosion and my soul leaves my body. I flinch in my seat and can see that others were jumping in their seats too. It caught my whole audience off guard just by how loud it was. It's funny to think about now, but I was genuinely terrified in the cinema. 
Anyway, the best thing I can say about this film is what it leaves you with. Truly great films leave you with a feeling. Oppenheimer ends and you walk away with a sense of nihilism. It's depressing in the best kind of way. It's affecting. It is also a think piece designed to create discussions and challenge certain viewpoints. When you walk out of that cinema, you realize you've seen something truly special. It has a deep impact with a message that is extremely relevant for today. It may have a few flaws, but Oppenheimer is incredible. One of Christopher Nolan's best, and one of the best of the decade so far. For my score, I'm going with four and a half out of five.